A phone is ringing. Hello, Paul. Uh, have you found the place yet? Oh yeah, it's a uh, it's it's great. It's uh, did you find Hop Hopuichun? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I'm at the village office right now, and, and I'm standing right there. Uh, what do you mean you don't see me? Y you know, like uh, I'm gray wearing a gray shirt, uh, the Asian guy, black hair, uh, medium size, glasses. Uh, is that obvious? Like, don't don't you see it? Okay. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Where are you? In Chunwan? No, oh no. No, no, I mean, I mean Hobuchun in Yunlong. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, well, I'll see you later and I promise I'll give better instructions next time. Okay, okay, see you soon. Okay. Click. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure how many of you have experienced going somewhere without clear instruction. I'm sure many of you have experienced this frustration. Oh, why, why don't you give me clear instruction? So I tell you this story not because it's a true story, uh, but also that, and also that if you ever come to my place, remind me to give you a GPS address. But uh, I share the story because uh, just just as it is crucial uh, to know the method to get to one location, how much more crucial it is for us to be confident in the method to be with God in heaven. And the only difference between uh, the heaven and a general location is that uh, the detail, the importance of the detail is not so much in the physical location, but the detail is a knowledge of an identity, the identity of Jesus Christ which is the only pathway to our Lord. The theological question we'll be asking today is, who is Jesus? Today we will be answering this question uh, in the passage that we just read, Colossians 1, 19 to 23. Um, so you can, uh, some of you can uh, open to follow. Uh, so Colossians 1, 19 to 23. This passage is one of the clearest description of who God is. Yet, in Christian history, it has been the most controversial uh, and debated verse. Uh, many cults use this very verse to discredit the deity and humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet Paul, uh, here's Paul, is writing from prison to a young church in Colossae which he has never met. Yet we know that Paul has much close connection with this church because in chapter one to three, we hear that there's a guy named Epaphas, who was most likely uh, who became a Christian under Paul and decided to bring this gospel to his hometown and he started a church. Now for this young church in Colossae, whom Paul is encouraging them of their faith, uh, learned, is learning to navigate the many cultural uh, differences uh, and cultural belief in their culture and different ideas of Jesus. And so Paul is here putting his foot firmly down on the theology of Christ, encouraging them to continue unwaveringly in confidence of who Jesus is, where they are going, and most importantly, that they continue to live a life worthy of Christ. And today, we can learn from uh, Paul's passage to learn that Christians must believe that who Jesus said he is, not shifting from faith and the works uh, of Jesus' work and his identity in order to be confident in God's promise of eternal life. And so with this, uh, let us pray uh, as we begin. Father God, thank you that we can be hearers of your word today. Thank you that you are speaking, God, that we don't have to guess uh, what you are like and who you are, but you speak clearly uh, through the passage and you have revealed it to your faithful servants. I pray this morning that you would speak to me, uh, speak through me, uh, and that we would be uh, able to hear uh, what you, your message today. Empower us with the clarity about your divinity and humanity so that we be confident in your promise and to live life worthy of you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does Paul say about Jesus? And how, how, does this, how is he encouraging this church? 
And so if we look at Paul, uh, Paul's verse in verse 15 to 20, he is proclaiming Jesus' deity, that, that Christ is God. And in his passage, uh, maybe we, we don't see this, but if we study, verse 15 and 20 is actually a doxology, only reserved for uh, people, who, uh, for for not people, but for God, and to call upon people to worship. It, it goes in the format of who he is, what he has done, and why we should worship. And God is, and Paul is using this proclaiming. He is God. Jesus is God above all. And for us Christians, what we must believe is that Jesus is fully God. How does he describe him? He says that he is the image of, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. To put it simply, Jesus is the God that we can see. How amazing is this truth? Now the image uh, in gr Greek means there's a general term meant representation. But the question that we need to ask is how close is this representation? Now some would argue that, okay, you have a statue and it represents the God. Oh, you have a coin, uh, you have a face on it and it represents the governor, but no one would really say that the coin is the governor or the statue is the God. So how can you say that God, Jesus in the image of God is God? Now scholars show that in kind of cultural sense, uh, that, that the Greek, the way they use symbols, some, in some sense, some symbol actually symbolize the actual presence of the real thing. Now Paul is borrowing that mindset and he says he is the image of the invisible God, the ones that we can't, the God that who we cannot see, but now he has manifested himself. Now how close, again, the question is how close is this image? Now we have to turn to other scriptures. Hebrew 1, 3, it tells us that Jesus is the radiant glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, okay? In John 1, 1 to 3 and 14, it says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. And the Word was with God in the beginning and all things were made through him and without him was nothing, nothing not anything was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. So Jesus is the manifestation of God. He is the presence of God. He is God in his character. When we see Jesus, we see God. God is in his personality is manifesting his compassion, his compassion for the lost, his anger against sin, his sacrificial love, his ability to raise the dead, his ability to forgive sin. This is all attributes of God. But some would argue farther, uh, further. But you know, in Genesis uh, one to twenty-seven, don't what, don't you use God? God made man in His image. So in that logic, does that mean we are gods? But no, Paul is not saying that. God, Paul is not saying that God that we have we share in God's sovereignty or God's all-powerful nature. But maybe in the argument, you can say that we too are supposed to represent God, but. Only Jesus in the flesh is the perfect image of a human being, of who we are supposed to be. So in next, Paul proclaims that he is the firstborn of all creation. Now here there is another sense of an argument. It's like, oh, firstborn, wait a minute. Does that, does that mean firstborn as in God first and then God created Jesus, like there's an, there's an order to it, firstborn as opposed to secondborn. Okay, so the term firstborn, Paul is using a Jewish term. Yes, there is a meaning of the time and order on, on some occasion, but it actually there in the Jewish term, there's another meaning, another sense of position. So not timing, but position. Paul is saying that Jesus is superior rank above all. Now, firstborn in the Jewish culture, yes, it has the special meaning of uh, that the firstborn uh, has special attention. And he is in the family, uh, the, representing the strength of the family. But over time, this expression has also evolved to mean the most important, the chosen one. And we see this evidence in Psalm chapter 89, verse 27. And this is... 
this is God making a promise to David, a, a covenant. And he says, <clears throat> I have found David, my servant, with my sacrificial oil and anointed him. And I appointed him to be my firstborn, the most exalted king of the earth. Now, if you remember uh, a, a test, a uh, Sunday school test question, uh, how, was David the oldest or the youngest brother? Now, the answer we know, he is the youngest brother. But here, Jesus is saying that he is the firstborn. So, in the term, we see the evidence of the firstborn using to say preeminence, the most exalted one. And in addition, this was a prophecy that under David, that the line of David, that God will send his Messiah, the chosen king, under his line. And so we see the prophecy in the use of the term firstborn does not mean order in creation, but the position of his preeminence. But the, argument, uh, but the argument and Jesus' identity is most clearly found in the context of what Paul is saying. If Jesus was only uh, second place or a creation, it would contradict what Paul is actually saying for the rest of the passage. In 16, it reads, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones in heaven and dominions and rulers or authority, all things were created through him, for him, and he is above all things, and in him all things hold together. This, can, this description does not describe any created being, but only describes God. So the term before all things, the term, so think before all things, Paul is proclaiming Jesus' eternal nature. He is responsible for the creation. The term all things hold together, Paul is proclaiming God's sovereignty. Now remember, Paul is actually in prison when he's writing this. But in his mindset, God is, Jesus is the one that holds all things together. He believes in the sovereignty of God. My chains is nothing. God is everything. And in the, mean, in the very moment of the cosmo, cosmic order, God is holding it together. Science says in the beginning, there was gravity. But if God was saying to, gra to gravity, be gone, then the universe will fall apart. There will be no stars. There will be no planets because God is the one holding it, responsible to hold it together. Jesus is the one responsible holding it together. And the real reason why you and I are still breathing and our heart is pumping automatically is because God is holding you together. Now, why is this relevant to the church of Colossae? Now, no doubt that Paul is not scolding them. He's not doubting their faith. Um, as we read in the first chapter, is that we pray for you since we have heard of your faith in Lord Jesus Christ and for your love for you ha that you have for all the saints. Colossae was an active church, but it was not easy to be Christian in that time, let alone to share the gospel. And Colossae city is a city of many beliefs. Now, in addition to the Roman emperor, emperor who is demanding worship, uh, the, the, open, uh, the emperor is asking, saying that I am the Lord, I am the master, you should be worshiping me. But Paul is saying there is no master but the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the same time, there's the small Jewish community who then branched off into Christianity and they both believe in the same God, but then there's G Jesus, you can see the confusion. And among all these beliefs, there were also the local gods that the Colossians really dedicate themselves. There were temples and they would go and worship, hoping that their sacrifice may change reality. And they are saying that if anything bad things happen to our city, maybe oh, it was that time that I didn't offer that sacrifice. And uh, they will be living in fear. Some of them will even be cutting their bodies, harming their bodies um, in order to worship this God, to change, to receive more blessings. 
uh, an example, actually, I, I, I remember. Uh, if uh, any of you are married here and you go through the Chinese tradition, you would give this, we have something called a betrothal, where the man goes to the woman's family to give all these things. And I remember when in preparation, I was like, oh, like, what is this tradition? What do I, have? okay, I, I don't come from Hong Kong, so I don't know, give me, give me the list. Uh, and, and, then they, and then you would ask advice and they would say, oh no, you have to have this, you have to have this, you have to have grapes with seeds, because if you don't have grapes with seeds, you won't have kids. So you can see, so I, and, and if you can imagine if someone doesn't have kids, oh, it was that time that I didn't give grapes with seeds and now I don't have kids. And I remember uh, hearing this, I was like, and I looked to my wife, I'm like, okay, I, uh, well, let's, let's just, uh, let's go with the flow with, with our, with our uh, what we want and let's ask your parents what they want. Okay, so we worked out that way. And so you can see, um, th this is just a small example and so some of the Christians would have claimed, if Christianity is claiming the exclusive worship of Jesus, who will worship the gods? Who will be bless bringing the blessing to our city? And wait a minute, did you mention that your pastor was in prison? Okay, if anything bad happens to the city, we know who to blame, the Christians. Okay, and you can imagine the difficulty and the countercultural, um, the, the, the situation that the Col Church of Colossae is facing. And in Hong Kong, uh, not only the, the betrothal, but there's, there's uh, many of you may, may be familiar with the term feng shui, which is uh, maybe some of your f friends really buy into it. Now, if you talk to them, you'll be like, okay, he's like half a believer, but okay, but when, when your health is on the line, the, your wealth, your business, your kids' well-being, Okay, they, they put their money where their belief is. And uh, even just, uh, I live in the village, uh, and some of, I just heard, yeah, like someone paid 3,000 to make sure their kids had the right name. And in the, in the act, they're saying, I'm trying to change my fate of my kids. I need to come up with a good name so they, have lucky, they are lucky, they will be blessed. Um, and so, but this is just a small example, and again, uh, it gets much darker when some of these beliefs, some of them harm their body. Nowadays, we, we have this belief of the, of the uh, of a LGBT community. Oh, in my spirit, I don't feel like I belong in the body, so I have to, to harm it. And so we give in to all these fears. Oh, I don't belong, I must have this. And so to get it, I must do something. And so this is the world that they live in. And Paul is saying, no, you don't have to do this. Christ has given his life. He is God above all. He holds, Jesus holds the world together. He can be trusted. No one, God alone, who holds the uh, to world together but Jesus. And so it is a reminder that the Colossians has nothing to fear. And compared to their old gods who control their life, Jesus is no match for and God is authority and all powerful. So as Christians, we must believe that God is fully, that Jesus is fully God. But Paul does not stop here. Paul is also proclaiming that in Jesus' power and divinity, he's also manifested in his humanity. And the reason God is worthy of worship in his power, he has, pro, he has manifested in his love, most clearly revealed in his humanity. And as Christian, we must believe that Jesus is also fully human. And in verse 18, it says, and he is the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, and everything that he, that he might have preeminence. For in him all things, uh, the, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth and heaven, making peace by his blood on his cross. And you, who were once alienated, hostile in mind, and e uh, doing evil. So, why does Jesus have to come in the flesh? Well, the answer is because of sin. We have all rebelled against God, becoming hostile and separated from God, deserving eternal punishment. 
but God seeks to reconcile. Now, reconcile is a very interesting question. Now, often when we think of reconcile, we think of human relationship. You know, I need to reconcile with my, my father. I need to reconcile with my friend. I need to reconcile with my wife. Um, and so, you know, uh, we, I, ha- I have a friend. We, I need to reconcile with him. We had, a, we had a breakup. And so probably, you know, it was mutual. He did something and I did something. It was a misunderstanding. So let's call it truce and forgive each other. But this is not the case for the relationship with God. Our offense is not mutual. We are the one who have offended God, rebelled against him. And it says, all sins have their part in the lake of fire. We have become hostile to God. But maybe you say, hostile to God? Like, I, I, hostile, me, hostile? No. Uh, the hostile to God, uh, I, I, don't, I won't say I hate God. Uh, how, how can you say that I deserve eternal hell? And the irony of this question is that we are never as bad when we compare ourselves to another person. You know, uh, if we compare ourselves to the worst person, of course I am going to be better. But if we compare ourselves to a holy God who is just, no one can stand. We are hostile. Well, when were we hostile? We were hostile when we say, this is my time, this is my life. And I have no desire to seek God, but have no desire to seek God and the things of God. You were hostile when you were blessed with technology, but you only use it for selfish reasons. You were hostile to God when you were in your actions, when you know it was wrong, but you did it anyways and said, oh, God will forgive me. You were hostile when you lied and when you exaggerate yourself to make yourself look better and in the same time, make someone else look worse. And so you and I were guilty of sin. We are alienated from God and his blessing. God owes us nothing. But reconcile is a very interesting word. It means to coexist in harmony. It is God's desire through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things by the blood of the cross, referring to his suffering and his death on that cross for our sins. Now, perhaps you, always, you, you have uh, always wondered, or I have always wondered, why blood? You know? And the answer is found in Leviticus chapter 7, 17. And God is giving his command, his contract to Moses and the Israelites about how to worship him. And he offers the animal sacrifice and also tells them not to eat the blood of the animal because it represents life, but also that this blood is symbolic and sacred. And so in Le- Leviticus 7, 11, seven eleven, okay, it says, okay, <clears throat> since the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it, meaning the animals, to you to make atonement of the altar for yourself because it, is, because it is the blood as life that makes the atonement. And so we find the very reason why Jesus have to be human in the flesh in order to pay for our sins, to fulfill God's covenant in our place. When Paul mentions in him all the fullness of, the fullness of God, the, the, the deity, the all-powerful God is pleased to dwell in this human body. He's saying that, yes, it is for this very reason. It is God's good pleasure and his divine power to manifest, his well, his, manifest himself this way on the cross in the person of Jesus. And this is where God's power life. In, in John, if you remember, the whole John theology is that the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the cross. He died for us. That's the glory. And, but not only that. He, he mentions that he didn't just die, but he is the firstborn of the dead. Verse 18, and it says, He is the head of the body, the church. And in the begin, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be have he might have preeminence now the firstborn takes the second meaning second meaning that we have in Christ's humanity it is saying that he is the first to rise from the dead leading all people 
who are willing to repent and to trust in his work to the result in verse 22 present you as holy blameless and above reproach before him Jesus who has lived the sinner's life that we could not he is able and willing to transfer this perfection to you and so when you come to God on judgment day and God asks you why I should let you in my head and the answer is God God has Jesus has transferred his perfect and sinless life to you so that you can have a blank slate and you are in, in, in the presence of God our sins are wiped clean God is saying to you that you are my son and you are my daughter you have a seat at my table because I see the faith you have in Jesus who have died for you and Paul warns us in verse 23 and, and this is a, a condition to this that all the blessing is actually hinged on this issue it says if okay if indeed you continue in faith stable steadfast not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which has been proclaimed to you to all creation under heaven in which I Paul is the minister to the, it, the word if scares us <laughs> is it it's like if like oh okay if if I don't does, does that mean I lose my salvation Okay, the first thing when we read, we, we think, oh, does, does this mean I lose salvation? And maybe it's easier to explain to you like what it does not mean first. Okay, now some people are, the, the issue that we are, we are a actually asking is, oh, I'm so worried. Have I sinned? Have I over sinned? <laughs> you know, have I, have I sinned a lot this week? Oh, I have done many wrong things. Maybe... Maybe I, I need to work harder to maintain my salvation so do God doesn't reject me. Paul is not saying this. Paul is not saying that we can, we're in Christ we can over sin because if we can do that, if, if it is the logic if that we can maintain our salvation, we are committing the same crime, the same problem as the Pharisees to say that, oh, it is by my works that I can keep myself in heaven. And if we can maintain our salvation then we don't need Jesus we can do it on our own okay but in John in 1st John 1 to 9 uh, 9 1st John 1 9 to 10 it says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purifies us from get this all unrighteousness all of it okay. so it is not the issue of over sinning okay we believe that Jesus has paid for our sins once and for all but call but Paul is making a clear point that it is possible to shift from faith so the question we have to ask is well how, how do we actually shift from faith uh, I want to pass this exam so I I, I want to make get, get this right how do how do I not shift from faith what is Paul talking about how do we how do we not shift from faith now often it happens that our faith need to be tested and to be found faithful in the identity of Christ. Paul's warning to, to the church of Colossae. In chapter 2, uh, we find that he's warning them about the different vain philosophy, human philosophy, the claims of supernatural realm, the claims of, oh, I saw an angel, and so da-da-da-da-da, and then you must do this. Okay, I saw an angel. And so, and so uh, in, this, in these philosophies and and human reason by nature it appears to have wisdom but has nothing to do with fleeing from sin and the wrath of God that is coming Jesus offer that payment on the cross for us and so Paul is saying don't shift from this hope of the gospel today we have many examples of different belief that try to shift us from the gospel maybe some supernatural experience that this guy experienced you know Buddhism would say oh like oh yeah I prayed three days and someone rose from the dead you know so they're talking about experiences that are so claiming authority of power but Jesus uh, but Paul is saying no Jesus is the only one 
the true Son of God. All things hold together in Him. We have other, we, like Colossae, we live in a culture of many beliefs. Like we have Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses who say Jesus is not God. Uh, in fact, we, have, we believe in two gods, uh, two different separate beings. But no, G Paul is saying that Jesus and God, Jesus is God. Okay, and in Islam it says Jesus is not God, um, merely a good teacher, and so He did not die for your sins. Uh, in fact, we can, you know, be righteous on our own. And and of course we have other different religions um, that claims uh, supernatural power. Um, I remember a testimony from uh, from uh, 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 one who. Uh, started a branch of uh, evangelism, and he, uh, and she was the one who is uh, uh, given her, herself to uh, the philosophy of New Age philosophy. And she got into Buddhism, and she was praying, and she's like, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta pray until like I have, I experienced this nothingness." And so, and and she did it, and she said, "Oh, I think a nothingness, and I feel like I see visions of God," and. And and she feels like she she upgraded. I, I'm I'm beyond human, and but but as she was having these experiences, she, they she started seeing weird vision of of gods having sex, and and it really bothered her. And and God's trying to kill her, and so she realized that oh, there is supernatural power out there, but this cannot be God. And when she believe when her Christian friends brought brought her to Christ, she realized no, there is. The authority, the one and only God, who created all things. But there's another example of shifting faith that I notice in our culture, and even in myself, and maybe even among the youth, is the confidence that is based on human relationship. Maybe you would hear that, oh, you know, like I'm so disappointed of Christianity. Uh, you know, people doing this, uh, churches like this. How can you believe th this God must not be real if, if they're not worshiping correctly? And so the faith is based on human. And I myself have also kind of experienced this. Uh, it, to tell you a secret, okay, <laughs> not a secret anymore, but uh, as a, I, I am a, some of you know me as a pastor's kid. Um, and so growing up as a missionary kid, uh, I've often heard. Um, uh, I, I, I promised myself, I was like, I, I would never be a pastor. And, then, and the reason is because, oh, I, I, would, I would hear my, my, my parents talking about uh, the drama that goes on <laughs> in church. And maybe some of you think, oh, missionaries are great. Oh, no, missionaries are just the same. They have arguments. And in fact, they probably have even heart heated up arguments. You know, you, you get missionaries who are uh, very strong-minded, individualistic. Now put them together, what are you going to get? You're going to get a mess. <laughs> okay, so uh, lots of drama. I was like, ah, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, and so even my spiritual growth was stunned by my f focus on human relationships. And so what is the issue that I'm experiencing? My issue is that I wasn't asking the real question, the, the true question of who Jesus is and what he has done. And so the, faith, uh, the struggle of faith, and God is uh, Paul is reminding us, that Christians must believe who Jesus is, not shifting from faith. And we must ask the question, who Jesus is and what he has done in, the, uh, in history. And so in application, uh, we remember that, Jesus, uh, that he is expressing that Jesus is fully God, fully man. He alone is eternal, the creator God, the firstborn of superior rank above all things. He alone is the one who paid the penalty for our sin. He alone is the authority of life, able to raise us, us from the dead, and he is able to present us as holy and blameless. And he alone holds all things together. And so brothers and sisters, as Christians, remember that Jesus is truly God and truly man and he is able to save us uh, let us pray okay. Lord Jesus uh, thank you uh, for the truth and the revealing of the gospel and, and this was writ written very early on in the early Christian centuries so it wasn't a development of, of uh, ideas about you but you have revealed yourself to the disciples and we can put our faith in it and thank you that you above all have died for us that in, in the day of judgment 
that we can present uh, we can be presented as holy and blameless and how wonderful is that truth thank you jesus for your salvation and i pray this in jesus name amen